Welcome to Shit Island, recommended by one out of ten dentists. You know, the one that's always disagreeing with the other nine in the commercials. His name's Jim. His name is Jim. <laughs> he lives Jim next door to me. Jim knows what's up. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, it's good to be back. Yes. It's been a while. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Sorry about that, people. No, we're not sorry. <laughs> we just took a little break. <laughs> Actually, yeah, fuck you, people. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. We didn't feel like doing it. We had other stuff to do. (laughs) You're not the boss of me, (laughs) listeners. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) We can do what we want, listeners. How about that? Exactly. Yeah. Maybe we will make an episode next week. Maybe we won't. Who knows? I mean, no, but it's good to be back. This is 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 legitimately fun. It's always fun to hang out with you two. Yeah. Yeah, sure. We also did uh, uh, a live stream on my channel where we made fun of uh, the Democratic presidential candidates. For like two hours, mm-hmm. that was fun. No, that I really fun. enjoyed that. I thought that was fun, and I think we should make that a thing that we we poke fun of the American election because there's so <laughs> much to make fun of. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, yeah. there are going to be live streams like that, you know, un- until the election in in September of 2020. So, ah, oh, yeah, we got like another year and a half uh, to do this. Yeah, I am so jazzed for that. I'm not going to lie, that is going to be yeah. hilarious. And if you have any. Uh, questions for us about the American election or anything we like to uh, wax no. poetic about the American <laughs> election. So if you have any questions about that. Yeah. I do actually follow uh, American politics a fair bit, so I might have like an actual answer uh, sometimes. Yeah. Do, yeah, however, I mean, keep in mind, not a one of us is American. <laughs> yeah. So. No, nah, but that doesn't matter. I mean, you know, Americans aren't <laughs> Europeans, but they have fuck loads to say about how Europeans should be doing stuff. That so. is... Well, and also yeah. a lot of Americans don't follow the news, don't follow yes, politics that, at all. Unlike them, mm-hmm. I do follow the fucking news and their history and everything. I know more about their country than I do my own, so... Yeah, but again, like Azure says, we're not actual Americans, so maybe we... You know, it's take it as, as satire, I guess, more so than like <laughs> actual opinion. <laughs> no, no, mine is actual opinion. The others are fucking satirizing. I'm actually opinionated here. I was trying to cover our asses, Jules. <sighs> I'm not. I'm trying right. to uncover my ass. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, let's not dwell on that. <laughs> Moving on. So, today's... Uh... <laughs> We're covering our bubble butts. <laughs> and moving on. Uh, yeah, you talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, multiculturalism, people. Yes. Or maybe we hate it, I don't know. We'll, we'll talk about it. This episode of Exciting Shit Island. <laughs> yeah, this is the episode we're going to come out against. Multiculturalism. <laughs> Yes, so I, I think, you know, the uh, refugees are actually trying to colonize us. So. Haha, yeah, we were xenophobes all along and you listened to us. <laughs> Six episodes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> surprise, motherfuckers. You've been fooled into following people who are bad. <laughs> yes, now you have to cancel yourself. <laughs> Didn't the South African Communist Party say something about immigration or race? That it was they had some slogan that was very racist. There's a party in South Africa called the Economic Freedom Fighters, who are like oh. left wing mm-hmm. people. Uh, okay. And their like ideology on Wikipedia, if you look them up, is anti-Europeanism. Nice. <laughs> nice. That's okay. well, fair enough. That's so. <laughs> that's going so hard. I can't even keep up. Yeah, I love it. Uh, I found the quote, by the way. All right. it's, <laughs> workers right, of the workers of the world unite and fight for a white South Africa. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what? That was the, the the slogan of the Communist Party in in uh, South Africa under apartheid. Ooh, some very big brain communist takes. Anyway, we're not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, different topic for a different day. Yeah, actually, we're probably never going to fully discuss South African politics. So <laughs> don't get your hopes up, people. <laughs> Multiculturalism. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to that. <laughs> Quick, Azure, what is multiculturalism? Uh, it's when it's when you live in Sweden and then a bunch of Muslims come in and fucking ruin everything, isn't it? Uh, more or less, yes. As ah. someone with uh, who almost has a degree in cultural geography, um, I can confirm that. Yeah. Multiculturalism is defined by Oxford English Dictionary as when Muslims come in and fuck everything up. Mm-hmm. I mean, more or less. 
That is the populist answer. That is more or less the populist answer, yeah, because it's yeah. interesting that, that culture, especially in Europe and, and in America, has been intermingling for so long, and yeah. people were cool enough with it to not like invent a specific word to condemn it uh, until people from the third world started coming up to the countries. Yeah. Basically, yeah. I mean, yeah, sure, listeners, people made fun of Italians, people made fun of whatever, but mm-hmm. uh, the Irish, uh, and it was an issue, but things didn't get specifically this violent or this pointed out at yeah. all times, constantly, all the time, as they are right now. The uh, Indeed. The xenophobic movement in Sweden specifically is interesting to study because it it has a very long history, but not a very coherent one. Um, mm-hmm. Essentially, you can say that it started out with, you know, uh, hatred of Finnish people, hatred of uh, Romani people, uh, wait a minute! Wait a minute! You guys hated the Finns? Yes, uh, oh. we colonized them or or we invaded them, and then we colonized Finland, and then they got they became independent, and then after a few decades, immigrants started coming from Finland to Sweden, and then we hated them because we didn't like immigrants. Huh? Um, even though Swedish people to this day still live in Finland after we colonized it. It runs deep. I have a Finnish friend who said that in the previous election, it was a big issue of whether or not to throw out the the Swedish-speaking community from Finland. Yeah. That sounds <clears throat> like a bad idea. Yeah, they had a specific plan. Some party or something, don't quote me on this, but he told me that some party had a specific plan in order on how to throw out all of the Swedish-speaking minority people from Finland. Yeah, that... Sounds I like feel it. like the EU would not approve. It runs into the same problem. I mean, not necessarily to compare whatever part of this was to the Nazis, but it runs into the same problem as the uh, German racial laws about, for example, uh, Jews. Uh, you know, the laws in Nazi Germany said that Jews are not citizens, but the laws did not specifically define what exactly a Jew was. You know, are you a Jew if both your parents are Jewish, or if your mother is Jewish, or if your grandmother is Jewish, like how far back does it go? I feel like the same problem would arise if, if Finland tried to expel all Swedish people. Like, okay, my great-great-grandfather was Swedish, does that make me Swedish, or...? Yeah, just one-drop laws again. Yeah. Just copy yeah. the Americans, one drop of Swedish blood and you're a fucking Swede. Yeah. Get out. I, thought, I thought the Nazis were very specific on who was and wasn't Jewish or Gypsy in terms of bloodline. They blood had a lot stuff. of fucking things, yeah. It became model... Uh, I, they, I'm, I think they had some sort of law, uh, but just I know there are a lot of cases where they just had no proper idea and they just kind of you know threw whoever into the concentration just camp. Just wing it. Just wing it. Like, there were plenty of people who would, under Nazi law, be counted as Jewish, but, like, some Nazi officer was like, no, you're not. Like, I decide that you're not, because you don't look Jewish or whatever. Yeah, yeah. there you go. And that's really what it is to me. To, to me, that's what multiculturalism, nationalism, Nazism, everything boils down to is, it's just people feeling irked or feeling uncomfortable being around people who look and act differently to them. Yeah. Like that's more or less what it is. It's like I don't feel com- I don't feel comfortable being around you because you're not like me and this is my country. Mm-hmm. And like for me the biggest dilemma is that it never like that also assumes that it was your country to begin with, but no, like, yeah. you did, you didn't own it physically. Like it's not that they've taken anything away from you. It's just that maybe you've been here longer but you never owned it. Mm-hmm. People who owned it were the people in power and like they they didn't think to to give you uh, the specific place that you lived on, you probably pay rent or mortgage or whatever. So you're you're just as much of a a person who only rents that place you live as as immigrants do. Also, we kind of kicked out the natives. So yeah, I don't think we did actually. I, I think no, I, I think the Danes, I don't think anyone actually lived in Denmark before the Danes did. I don't think so either. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I think it was just Sami some people, slab of boring land. Some of people lived in large parts of of northern and central Sweden and. Uh, uh, you know, they were the native inhabitants, and then we decided that, no, we're the native inhabitants. <laughs> and didn't, this is me assuming, didn't Swedes come from Danes, or offspring of Dane or something like that? Uh, or am I from the Viking Age, or something? I don't know. I'm, Swedes, I'm in deep water here. Uh, so, so there, there are th- two, or I guess three people groups in Sweden. Uh, the Sami people, who were the natives, the Swedish people, very confusingly called the Swedish people or the Svea people, who live uh-huh. in basically the the middle or slightly to the south of the middle of the country around the Stockholm region, um, mm-hmm. and they 
are descendants, I believe, uh, of the Danes and like the Vikings. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. And then there are the Gothic peoples in Western and Eastern Gothia who originally, like a lot, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, came from the Gotland people. Uh, right. The, the island the, of Gotland. Yeah. yeah. The Jeets. Uh, the right. Visigoths and just yeah, the Gothic people generally. So a Germanic tribe, uh, more so than Nordic. Okay, well, um, yeah, but again, to me, if you want to talk about multiculturalism as a term, I kind of group it in with other buzzwords like cultural Marxism and postmodernism because <laughs> yeah. it doesn't really have any set definition. If you look it up on Wikipedia, for instance, or some other place, it just defines it as a, a wide ranging scope of sociological concepts yeah. it doesn't have one specific meaning because it changes from group to group uh, and it mostly seems to be used as a derogative or as in some way to describe negative consequences of the huge mm. wave of immigration that happened in the western world in the 1960s and 70s i think uh a fine example of just how bullshit multiculturalism or, or opposition to multiculturalism is is looking at uh, the various waves of immigrants that have come to Sweden over the decades. Um, I uh, who was who was it before? I can't remember. There, there was one other way before the Yugoslav Wars. Um, um, what migrant neighbors from like I don't know North Africa, Middle East, or yeah, that's what we had. North Africa would be one. Um, if I'd guess, it would be like the uh, post-war uh, migrant labor, or not my, yeah, migrant labor is uh, which we brought in hmm. and then never sent back because hey, it turns out we needed them for quite a while. Yeah, during the Yugoslav Wars, there was a wave of immigrants from Yugoslavia, a lot of uh, Croats, Bosnians, and Serbs mainly, and uh, there was a a political party in Sweden called New Democracy which was basically the precursor to the Sweden Democrats. Yeah. They're, they're not connected in any official capacity, but they're basically the exact same party. Uh, so right. New Democracy arose as a you know, national conservative populist party against immigration from Yugoslavia. And then, you know, after a decade or two, they died out and everyone basically forgot they existed. Uh, and then mm. uh, in 2015... It was another wave of immigrants, but this time from the Middle East. And then a new party came up called the Sweden Democrats, who opposed immigration from the Middle East. But it's interesting to see how, you know, once upon a time, people from, from Bosnia and from Serbia uh, and, uh, were despised basically as much as people, like Arab people, are today. And like rumors are spread about them and like they're violent and they're drug lords and they're war criminals and all of these terrible things. And now, you know, the Serbs, oh, they're such a fine people, you know, they integrate into the Swedish culture and and they work hard and, uh, you know, they're such fine people, such neighborly people. We love them. We've always loved them. Don't research into that. Don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just like we hmm. we. The, the the right wing always needs like some group of people to hate on, and as soon yeah, as um, it you know wasn't popular to hate on the Serbs anymore, well, the Muslims are they're a great target. They're right there. Yeah, exactly, and and that's so typical of all the reactionary right wing movements is that they will deal with whatever issue comes up in the day completely out of touch with reality of like what was popular yesterday. Yeah. Look at the Republicans in America, for instance. Uh, 10 years ago, all they talked about, actually up until about five years ago, all they talked about on their uh, conventions and in the media was how terrible Obamacare was and how um, Obamacare was socialism and it was going to destroy America, et cetera, et cetera. Now at, at this year's CPAC, because they tried to get rid of it and basically couldn't, they're saying, no, no, Obamacare is fine. Obamacare is fine. Uh, nothing wrong with Obamacare. What's really worrying is this Medicare for all business. Obamacare yeah. is good. Obamacare is now good uh, because they tried and failed. 
but um, this new proposal, this new thing that they're talking about, that's going to be that's going to destroy America, and that's yeah. basically how the reactionary movement always works: is that whatever is being dealt with right now that they can try to push back is what they will deal with, but they don't think back two days to see what they believed two days ago and see if it corresponds to or in any way contradicts what they believe today yeah. and what they'll believe tomorrow. And and it's so interesting to <clears throat> try, like, if you try to say to you know a sweden democrat you know don't you remember how it went for new democracy uh most of them will say what now what party was that what are you talking about <laughs> right exactly yeah like m- people don't even remember that there was you know xenophobia against uh immigrants from former yugoslavia mm-hmm. uh, but like that was that shit was horrible if you were an immigrant from yugoslavia you were treated like a I mean, like an alien from outer space, like you, like you were <laughs> some sort of non-human, unknown element, and like you, people yeah. didn't want to give you work, people didn't want to live next to you, um, people mm-hmm. thought you were. I mean, people thought that you were a, a dangerous criminal, and so you ended up living in you know the poverty-stricken part of the city, and then you became a you know involved in drugs and crime because no one would give you a job. That makes a lot of sense. To put it into a Danish context, we've had this thing like we we we've always been or traditionally been a very homogenous people, mm. as we discussed earlier. Um, but in this in the late '60s, we had a big wave of of migrant workers, and we've had subsequent waves of migrant workers. But what we've done that I think you've done differently from what I've heard is that we've intentionally isolated them from society by putting them into self-described ghetto areas mm. where they would only be around people like themselves. Or if we haven't done that, then we've uh, then what we've done is we've completely removed them and put them into camps where they won't be around other people and they'll work and then come back to the camps. And we've manufactured this problem that's been around since the 60s by not letting them become regular members of society the same way that yeah. other countries have. So the only reason that that the right-wing populist movement can really exist is because we have successfully made them non-people in a Danish context for so yeah. long that it just it's become the truth all of a sudden by not letting them show that they can you know be a part of society the the people who actually are like in society and aren't in the ghetto areas that they were assigned in the 60s have integrated yeah. very well into danish society and are treasured members of society and and even the most right wing uh, people in the in the populist movement will say, "Oh no, we don't mean this person. This person's totally fine, even though they're a Muslim. We mean these people who were starving in camps, who have to go out and commit crime to feed themselves." Basically, yeah. Actually, the Netherlands had a pretty similar uh, approach to our uh, migrant. Net. Not as bad as that, but fairly similar, which also caused a lot of problems. Because, like, what we did is, um, okay, so we wanted all these you know workers to you know reconstruct uh, after the war. And basically, we figured, well, we only really need the men here to speak Dutch because they'll be, you know, doing the fucking work. So the only people who were offered any like language courses were, you know, the men, and or, like the adults, men. So the whole rest of the family just wouldn't learn Dutch because they would just be in their own community where everyone else would speak uh, Arabic or Turkic or whatever other Turkish or whatever other um, language and they would just never <laughs> learn Dutch because right. they don't there's no need for them to learn Dutch and also there was not really anyone offering them to learn it either. It's not, there was not seen as priority but then you know, at the time the explanation was also like these people aren't going to be here for like a few years and then, you know, we won't be needing all this uh, labour anymore and you know, they'll probably go back or something. They didn't really think of like learning to them like, hey, these people might actually just be living here now and just staying. Uh, didn't really think of like, so wh- what are we going to do with them then? Uh, next step wasn't really made until I don't know how long afterwards, which caused a lot of problems. Yeah. And then there's of course our shenanigans with uh, the uh, Moluccans from Indonesia, which uh, is a whole other story, but uh, suffice to say, we really fucked up the integration there. That's an uh, interesting story if you ever, uh, want to look it up, but uh, we fucked it up. Yeah, Sweden has uh, Sweden has a lot of uh, problems with integration that are kind of um, 
not directly the Swedish government's own fault, uh, because you you can say that the Swedish government tries to get people to integrate into the rest of society, uh, what with language courses and and that kind of thing. But the the people who arrive here, uh, I mean, mainly from you know war torn regions who don't have much, uh, they will end up living in the poor side of town, right? And yeah. uh, because that's the only place they can afford to live, and then that kind of becomes the you know the Arab part of town. It becomes its own, even though like the Swedish government doesn't want that, but they also are not prepared to like help those people. Yeah, like a lot at least. I mean, they get some welcome package thing. I'm pretty sure, but they all end up living. Um, in, in, you know, quite poverty-stricken areas. Uh, you know, areas that were uh, traditionally, you know, very white, working-class, uh, you know, like factory worker areas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it, it does seem like most of this issue, specifically with immigration in Northern Europe, comes from bad planning. Like, they just oh, yeah. never thought far enough ahead to include Muslims in society mm-hmm. like in like in the Netherlands and Sweden and Denmark you didn't you never really thought that this was going to turn into such a big deal it was more just like a panicked maneuver in the b- b- opening stages of the oil crisis yeah we need people now for whatever reason and uh, we'll s- sort them out later whenever maybe <laughs> i think we'll let um, the next couple of prime ministers deal with this issue yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll do it out some other time i'm not, not uh, i'm not a city planner obviously Jules is. But yeah, yes, I, I think that the reason that this happens so easily is because the the working class areas, um, the people who lived there, were never supposed to have social mobility in the first place. And now yeah. all, all of the working class people they don't live there anymore because they've all become middle class now. But and now the new working classes are like m- mainly immigrants, and the reason that they can't integrate into society is because they don't have any social mobility because they live in the areas that were you know designated for poor people who were supposed to be poor for the rest of their lives pierre bourdieu talked about this a whole lot uh, he has some some very interesting um i think he was a post-marxist like um uh, judith butler he uh of course came up with the uh, social capital theory which um but he he, he wrote about that uh, a whole lot about how there was a suddenly in the 60s and 50s in Western Europe after the Second World War, a, a huge group of people were lifted from working class to middle class. And it happened so quickly that the people who had traditionally had access to the things that came with having a lot of capital had to come up with new ways to exclude the people who could now afford to participate from participating. And that then turned into social capital clauses. Like you have to buy this type of clothes or you have to live here or you have to uh, be a Christian or like all these clauses that uh, eventually turned into what we have now where we mostly exclude people or or, um, the rich mostly exclude people based on these clauses, uh, social clauses that keep out immigrants and keep out people who come from working class backgrounds and so on and so forth. Yeah. Ice cream used to be considered a luxury in Sweden until, uh, <laughs> until about the 80s. Uh, I remember that. Bananas were considered a huge luxury as well uh, in the 50s and 60s. Yeah. But now you can buy them for nothing in the supermarket. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, in terms of like, planning of this, it is, generally speaking, there's quite a lot one can do about uh, like promoting integration and whatnot. It's just uh, not always done, Yeah. <laughs> which is a shame. But uh, as you know, I do have a degree in this, and we'll soon have another two degrees in this nonsense. Um, it, it depends. If, like, if you look at, like, say, Singapore, um, which is a fairly diverse country, actually, uh, city, really. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like I don't know, forty percent like Chinese, twenty percent are some other group, and then you know the rest of them are uh, yet another group. It's I don't know. It's an interesting mix of people, but the way they do it there is basically they don't allow. Um, for this kind of uh, spatial segregation to occur yeah. in many respects, which is good. They actually legally uh, force people to live in certain places. And if you have like a, an apartment building, it needs yeah. to have a certain uh, ethnic makeup and whatnot. So. 
eth- ethnic quotas for uh, for apartment buildings and uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, but you know, then you also have you know our countries where we're just like yeah. Just put them in a camp somewhere. Hey, we still have like, yeah. like work we did in the Netherlands. Like, hey, we still have these concentration camps left over. Just yeah. put them in there. Done. Ouch. So that's another way you can handle it. Sad. Yeah, yeah it's not as good. You know, yeah, I mean the the housing in in Sweden basically still today, but I mean it's basically what what it has always been is there's houses for the middle class and then there's houses for the you know, like the dirt poor. Um, mm. and if if you're working class, basically, you can never really get to live in the middle class apartments. Like the price difference is just way too much for there to be any real kind of social mobility. Like even if you manage to get a raise, you won't be able to get a nicer apartment in the nicer part of town because you will need to like get a new job, like a completely different career. And just turn hmm. your life around to actually be able to move to a nice part of town because the housing in the big cities is ridiculously expensive unless you live in what basically what is designated the working class part of town. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, you can basically say that city city planning in Sweden is designed to have to segregate the working class from the rest of society. Oh, uh, yeah, that is fairly common throughout uh, all societies really yeah. it is yeah the us takes it like a step further but uh yeah, it's uh, insane uh, and the unforeseen consequence of doing that was that you know the the swedish working class disappeared and the immigrants uh started living in the working class areas instead and now the swedish government is trying to get those people to integrate but i mean they all live together in one area and swedish people generally speaking don't live there and I bet if you go back to the days before the switch came, the same kind of rhetoric kind of were applied to the Swedish working class, either through condemnation of communism or activities that they were doing or their behaviors or the way they acted or yeah. whatever. I, th- I think there is just generally a veiled uh, commentary on um, the working class or people who have very little uh, that's still going on and it never changed um, uh, from the 1800s. Mm-hmm. I read I read a really interesting book, sorry, the final thing um, about about this this topic by a Danish professor um, at uh, Roskilde University called Eben Jensen, who commented on how we today in, in Western societies talk a lot about tolerance, like uh, uh, ethnic tolerance, and we have to tolerate each other. But uh, that it's it's really that which is causing a lot of strife as well. This is, of course, coming from a very liberal perspective in that we shouldn't tolerate each other. We should discuss with each other and talk like, wh- why and have a, d- a dialogue about why we believe what we believe. And this this is all, you know, very uh, a basic. But it also she also says that we should still have the, the spine to hold firm on what we believe, because I think. Um, what people who are who, who base their entire identities and their entire value sets ag- to be against multiculturalism mostly hate is the spinelessness they perceive in people who are for multiculturalism or for helping refugees, or for helping people in need, or for uh, supporting that other people from other cultures can come to the country is that they think that there's a spinelessness attached to it, which is letting people walk all over your heritage or your traditions or uh, this white genocide narrative, which is so stupid, which says that uh, white people are being killed uh, or like wiped out in favor of uh, the immigrant uh, hordes coming from from the, the Middle East and Africa, um, yeah. wh- where in, in fact all stats show that you know there have never been more white people on the planet than right now. It's just that there's also a lot more people who aren't white mm. that have also come to live on on the globe. It's I it, I think yeah spinelessness is is what's attached to it, and I think she does a good job in that book uh, Introduction to Cultural Understanding of yeah. of saying that uh, just because you support other cultures or that you're willing to engage in conversation with them to better understand them doesn't mean that you have to then just submit to what they want out of a society. You can still be someone who's open to talking to people that are different to you and still be someone who has their own values and their own morals. I think the, um, the not necessarily the white genocide narrative, but the general feeling of right-wing people uh, that they are being replaced um, is true to some extent for 
um, at least in Sweden, in for the the working class people who you know have lived their entire lives and and you know their their family lived their entire lives in these working class areas, uh, which have now shifted to become uh, immigrant areas, mm. and for those people, they are legitimately the minority now in those areas, and in their day to day, they are the minority. And so they are feeling replaced, they are feeling neglected, and they are feeling like there's a horde of immigrants coming from some unknown part of the world where they don't understand the culture or the language, uh, and they're coming here and they're taking the jobs and they're taking over and, you know, they're making everything worse and the government has to give them a bunch of money. Uh, because the people who are members of the Sweden Democrats uh, largely are working class and come from those backgrounds and, and come from those areas with a lot of immigrants, where a lot of the immigrants have ended up. Mm. And I f feel like the Sweden Democrats would not have risen to their popularity if the people who came here, if, if we actually managed to spread out the immigrants a bit more so that they didn't all right. just live in the one part of the one town. They didn't all yep. live in fucking Malmo. They didn't all, li all live in eastern Gothenburg, you know. Yeah, that was, again, the, the, the whole thing about long-term planning that completely failed uh, yeah. from the politician side. And it is really interesting to... The Danish media has put a specific focus on um, Scania, which voted uh, overwhelmingly for the Sweden Democrats and gone out and, and interviewed a lot of people in southern Sweden to ask them why they voted for, for this uh, right-wing populist party. And it did seem like the main answer was that they don't feel like the people of Stockholm and the people of the rest of Sweden takes their concerns seriously or listens to them or even considers them as valid as themselves. So yeah. there's more of a... And, and um, it, it, they see it kind of both as an act of rebellion against Stockholm, but also as a response to this thing that you, you, you bring up, this general anxiety that I think is also being stoked by these online medias and, and the right wing that yeah. uh, this base uh, anxiety you feel when you encounter people who are different, it's being um, it's being validated and it's being stoked on by these people on the right wing to, and, and encouraged and and um, and fed through through these official sources, which confirm that you're right to be nervous or scared of what's different because they want to hurt you, which is not the case in the vast, vast majority of the time, but it's something that the media plays into, and um, yeah. it's sad. Yeah, I mean, the the Sweden Democrats definitely want to try to confirm the the fears that those people have, uh, because they they want us to see themselves as the anti-establishment party, and they want to brand themselves as this kind of rebellious party, the party that all the other parties, all the establishment parties hate. And they basically say, you know, yes, it's true. Stockholm doesn't care about you. Stockholm doesn't care about your concern. And yes, the immigrants are coming here and they are taking your jobs and they are taking over. And Stockholm right, exactly. isn't going to do anything about it. And, you know, if you vote for us, you know, Stockholm would really hate that. You know, Stockholm hates us. Exactly. They, Stockholm hates us as much as they hate you. So, you know, we're kind of on the same team. They're so good at stoking and figuring out what people are afraid of or what people feel like these frustrations that are that are natural to to any kind of removed area yeah. from the capital. They're so good at that. You see that in Denmark too. The people who overwhelmingly vote for our version of the right wing populists are also from uh, areas that are geographically far removed from Copenhagen, yeah. the capital of Denmark. You you see them being very effective at at getting this message out that these people in the capital with their lattes and their left-wing SJW ideologies, they don't understand what it's really like to be someone who's really from this area and all the issues you're dealing yeah. with and and just painting these, these pictures that don't correspond to reality, but definitely help to uh, um, correspond to to this, this fear that people have of everything that's new. Yeah. Um, I mean, Stockholm has basically always been hated uh, by everywhere in Sweden that is not Stockholm. Oh, Copenhagen too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, it, it stems largely from uh, 
from the idea that you know Stockholm, in, you know they, that's where the parliament is, and that's where uh, you know. Well, right now it's not, not it's only one tenth of the population now, but you know back in the day it would be uh, quite a big, large chunk of the population would live in Stockholm. You know, Stockholm would be seen as you know the seat of power and. They're, they decide everything and they vote on policies and they don't actually understand how those policies are going to affect people living in the countryside and they're all just city folk and, and, and they do, you know, they do politics that benefits them but hurts everyone else. There's a word for that in Denmark, uh, which means acting like someone from Copenhagen. Mm. <laughs> it's a derogatory term. Yeah. No kidding. And... Uh, yeah. I, I I guess it comes sort of from the old 20th century class struggle between the, the working class living in the countryside and the the bourgeoisie living in the in Stockholm, because that would uh, make a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. I guess you could kind of say that this this feeling that you know the capital is bourgeois, this the capital is of the elites, as as you know you would say now, it's kind of the same feeling that the people have. But instead of it mm-hmm. being workers against the rich, it's you know the countryside against the political elite who don't uh, who don't care about you. And it's not about class struggle anymore. It's just about I, I guess struggle against Stockholm in general. Yeah, and yeah, I think I think you're so on on the money with that. And I think that um, back before the I I I don't know I I do this thing where I relate everything to the fall of the Berlin Wall because mm-hmm. I feel like it's such an important uh, time in history where everything kind of changed and where everything got a new meaning uh, or lack thereof and I think one of the the main things that happened after the fall of the the Soviet Union was that all this fight for idealistic causes kind of went away because there was this uh, unspoken agreement that neoliberalism and capitalism just won and it was even spoken in some circles and 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 confirmed by by a lot of of liberals and national liberals saying that okay so uh all this hippie stuff and all this socialist stuff is just over it's done now we won it's going to crumble anyway and a lot of the people in denmark anyway that were members of the uh, student rebellion of the of the 60s and 70s and the feminists of that era as, as well if you follow what they've done since then most of them shockingly to me anyway have kind of become like right-wing populists and mm-hmm. i think that speaks to how in in a capitalist society the only way that you can really protest something the only thing that you that offers a real alternative or or some area where you can have some kind of influence is through immigration or through demographics because that's the only area that isn't being uh, economically managed by some uh, person sitting in the world bank or the oecd it's the only area where you can feel like you have some kind of autonomy or some kind of decision to make are you for people coming into the country or are you not and th- that's so depressing to think about, but I really think that's that's the case. Like everything isn't uh, socialism versus capitalism anymore. It's um, for or against immigration in this predetermined uh, neoliberal economy. Hmm. Yeah, I guess you could say it's sort of about nationalism uh, versus anti-nationalism or soft soft nationalism, I suppose. I think yeah. the, the left wing, I mean, it doesn't, speak to the these people at all and the people who feel left out and the people who feel replaced and the people who do feel anxious and Mm -hmm. you know there's there's something to be said that there's no point in trying to convert people who are like staunch die hard xenophobes and nationalists you know Mm -hmm. probably isn't worth even trying at that point but like the left wing in in scania are basically dead they basically don't exist because they don't really do anything different there from anywhere else in the country. Right. They, you know, they, they follow the Stockholm line, basically. They say immigration is good <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and you know, if you don't think so or, you know, if you have any other perceptions, uh, then you're a racist, basically. I see. Yeah, that's a problem. And it's not that you have to say that immigration is bad. It's just that you have to open a real dialogue with people or explain why it's good yeah. in a way that isn't self-evident, like you maybe could assume in Stockholm. Yeah. 
uh, I think I, I like the line that the left party has had in in Sweden and in a lot of places in Sweden for a long time is anyone who votes for the Sweden Democrats or even considers voting for the Sweden Democrats is a lost cause. They're racist and xenophobic, and there's just no point in trying to convert them. Basically, right? Yeah, I would I would think that a lot of the people who are very passionate about it are the same people who would have been very passionately for the student demonstrations in the '60s in Paris and around Europe. Maybe yeah. it's the same spirit. Yeah, it's the same fighting for some kind of change of values in society that's tangible. Yeah, I mean, a, a huge part of um, Sweden Democrat members are also members of the Social Democratic Labour Union, uh, LO, yeah. uh, which is like the main union in in Sweden. Right. Yeah, and the same in Denmark. The Danish variation of that party is also social democratic, and in some ways are even more left wing than the social democrats of Denmark, <laughs> like yeah. in a lot of their policies, which is worrying. But also, like, yeah, oh, I don't yeah, know. the social democrats here are, are becoming neoliberals. They are, yeah, uh, hardcore neoliberals here at least. This episode of Shit Island is brought to you by Trans Rights. Trans Rights, we said it. So we got some emails uh, since. We've been away for a couple of weeks now. We've been away for a week and a half, two weeks. So we haven't really had a chance to address the emails that we've gotten from people who've sent emails to shitislandshow at gmail.com. That's shitislandshow, just out in one, at gmail.com. Uh, so uh, Azure, which, uh, which contributions have we had this week? Joseph says, hey, I'm a big fan of the show and have been very much enjoying it for the last several weeks. I'm a recently graduated European college student. Uh, a recently graduated student from Belgium, so I can very right. much relate to most of the topics that you discuss. I wanted to ask you guys' opinion about some f- events in Europe, namely the crackdown on refugees in Denmark. Of that mm-hmm. is actually, if that is actually the case, I read an article about it, and the big victory of the fascist party in the Netherlands. If I'm not wrong, two of you guys are from there. This is. Part of the general discussion of the rise of the far right parties in Europe, which I would love to hear discussed on the podcast. Best wishes. Well, first off, Mazel Tov on the university thing. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, congrats. I don't actually know if it was the university, just as graduated student. Oh, okay. Well, let's do well, that again then. Congratulations. <laughs> Having at one point uh, graduated then. From some form of education. Yes. A big congratulations. Uh, you could That's be- really cool and, and a big accomplishment. No, good on passing primary school. <laughs> Long may you run, and thank you for your support. Uh, thank you. About the the Danish crackdown, I haven't been following the news that much, I will admit, but um, most of the things that the media have discussed, the foreign media, have been proposals by right wing the right-wing populist party and uh, right-wing populist elements within the liberal Danish party, uh, the currently governing party. Uh, It hasn't, they haven't actually done anything that they'd said they'd do that uh, the Guardian has picked up on the concentration-ish camps. They haven't built those. Um, It was more of an appeal to the voters is my guess because it's, it turned out to be extremely expensive and also just incredibly inhumane, even more so than, than what they're currently doing. And a huge majority of Danes are against it. So I highly doubt that they're actually going to do it this side of the election anyway, because there's going to be an election this summer. So if they win big, if they, which it doesn't look like, it looks like the right-wing populists are going to be halved in support. I just saw uh, some opinion poll that says that they're going to get slaughtered by the election, the right-wing populists, because they've done some unpopular things that I'm not going to get into right now. But um, uh, if they win big, maybe, maybe they're going to, do those terrible things, uh, crackdowns, concentration camps, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I wouldn't, I, I don't think they will as things are right now. Thank you for the question. Um, as for my part of that question, no fucking clue. Like I said, I don't follow Dutch politics and I barely know of this party. I know what party they're referring to. It's the Forum for Democracy or Forum for Democracy. Mm-hmm. Um, that's all I know about them, frankly, just that they did uh, very, they, they didn't exist prior to this election cycle really but they got a decent amount of votes in this one and became one of the bigger parties actually hmm. uh, for our um, the Senate uh, election sort of it's a bit of a complicated missile system but honestly I have no idea really who they are because I don't follow Dutch politics so I'm afraid I can't answer that question What about Geert Wilders? Is he still around? 
He's still around. He's still an idiot. Um, Is he still popular? Uh, he hasn't been <coughs> growing much in popularity, I don't think. But he also hasn't been shrinking. He's just he's holding steady at a too high rate. <laughs> that said, ah. though, like to the extent that I do follow this stuff, um, like our various right-wing parties do a lot to appease that voting block and have been adopting uh, some of his uh, positions, uh, particularly on like immigration and cultural nonsense. So. Yeah, I've noticed, yeah. Uh, speaking of, of Sweden, as we just did, I've noticed that the moderates in Sweden have been kind of approaching some of the proposals of right-wing populists this oh, last yeah. election. 100%. Uh, especially when it comes to crime and uh, mm -hmm. um, the, the whole, um, like, I can't remember, the, the whole ghetto y ghetto problem yeah. thing integration yeah. i guess yeah generally. that stuff yeah um yeah uh the the moderates actually i think it was yesterday i genuinely thought it was an april fool's joke but they they have changed their logo this isn't really gonna uh, um, shock anyone outside of sweden but they've changed their logo back to the one they had uh in 2008 or I think prior to 2008. Um, so b basically, uh, the moderates went through like this whole uh, change in appearance where they they were like, okay, guys, we know that everyone hates us um, and we're a bit too conservative. So now we're not the moderates anymore. We are the new moderates. And that became their logo, the new moderates. Um, oh, like new labor. Basically, yeah, except in the other direction. Yeah, they went okay, that makes more sense. liberal, you know, they're liberal conservatives, but during the new moderate era, uh, as it, I have now coined the term, um, they were more liberal than conservative. Ah, but ever ever since the last election, um, they they've moved more towards the Sweden Democrats, and now they've officially changed. Uh, back to just the moderates they're not the new moderates anymore it's so funny because I, I the only reason i remember this is because it was during the swedish election just a couple of days before the moderates sent some delegation to copenhagen to visit the danish conservative party and they were so happy that they came to visit them because the conservative party in denmark receives somewhere between two and three and a half percent of the votes so they're <laughs> tiny they have six members in parliament and uh, they were just so, so happy to be able to take pictures with them and say, look, we're important. Um, I just think it must have been some clerical error that they didn't go to visit the, the liberal ruling party or something, which are also conservatives. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, that, it was, just, it was so adorable. That does possible, actually. <laughs> they got it wrong. They look, looked up conservative party on Wikipedia and that's the one they found. Speaking as someone who has done, like, political activism in terms of like political parties that sounds very plausible that someone just made an error somewhere in like uh, you know googling something mm, it does, <laughs> i know that it? happens that's just it happens more often than you might think from uh, these organizations unpaid interns man yeah <laughs> anyway um so the the moderates um so so f for those who don't know in sweden for a long time there has been a coalition or, uh, well, an alliance between political parties called the Alliance. Uh, or it's called the Alliance. Officially, it's called the Alliance for Sweden. But no one calls it that. It's just the Alliance. Uh, it's between the Liberal Party, the Centre Party, the Moderates, and the Christian Democrats. Um, after the last election, the Alliance basically broke up uh, with the Centre Party and the Liberals... Um, entering into what is called the January Agreement with the Social Democrats against the wishes of the Moderates and the Christian Democrats. So now the Moderates and the Christian Democrats have basically become best friends with the Sweden Democrats. And the center centrists and the Liberals have sort of gotten a bit closer to the Social Democrats, but like not by much. Mm. So the Moderates definitely have become much more nationalistic and much more conservative uh, recently. And, um, and the, Christian they Democrats, have, yeah. um, the Christian Democrats, weirdly, have always been an irrelevant party, but now they're starting to attract some Sweden Democrat voters somehow. 
Um, okay. So they're, they're like a version of the Sweden Democrats that's part of the establishment, and they're also slightly more sensible, not quite as radical. Uh, like they don't feel as radical as the Sweden Democrats do, and so they appeal to some people who would otherwise vote Sweden Democrat. Do you think there's some people in Stockholm, some rich kids that rebel against their parents by voting for the Sweden Democrats? Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> They're just like, screw you, mama and papa, I'm going to vote <laughs> for the plebeian party. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I, I think there are definitely kids who do that uh, to their parents. <laughs> like genuinely, I, I can think of a few people who would do that to their parents. Like, if you have social democratic parents, you're just like, well, I'm going to vote for the Sweden Democrats. How about that, mom and dad? <laughs> just before you, you choose to involve yourself in politics in any way, you're just like, what is my parents? Who do my parents hate? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, an old anyway. sense to rebel against your parents, I think, but uh, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised that it happens. Anyway, did, did we answer the question? I feel like we answered the question, didn't we? I mean, just, uh, just what do you... Uh, the question is basically... What do we just think about the rise of the far right parties in in Europe? Uh, I think I we we've like talked it. about that in the in this in episode, the, kind of yeah. a little. Yeah. Touched it's, it anyway. uh, another email. <coughs> yes. Go for it, all of them. Uh, this email is from Lance, who says, in many social democratic circles, the term neoliberal is meant to refer to socially liberal but economically conservative Democrats. In communist circles, it refers to them. Have you noticed this sort of phenom- phenomenon? What would you say is the correct term, correct usage of the term neoliberal? Ah, oh, we're going to go on a Wittgenstein train here. I suppose mm. so. Mm, well, I th- the correct I, way of using it is the one which makes people understand what you're trying to get at in that circle of uh, people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's going to be another one of those words that people just use for everything like socialist or postmodernist or yeah or postmodernist exactly cultural marxist i think it's going to be one of, if it's not already i think it's going to be one of those words neoliberalism the, i think it is already that there's a subreddit a really popular subreddit on uh, on reddit called neoliberal um, oh yeah but it's not about like reaganomics or or like neoliberal economics it's basically just a, a party for the democrats to make fun of the moderate democrats or no, it's just it's just a it's just a subreddit where people are Democrats. Unironically, yeah. So people people willingly use the term neoliberal to describe themselves. To. Yeah, I mean, basically, yeah. basically, oh I think the pe- the people who subscribe to that subreddit, Ugh. they are liberals, but they want to seem like no, we're not old liberals. We're new liberals. We're cool liberals. Oh my uh, god! They're liberals yeah. who also have a big fucking support for you know, the free markets. Yeah. I mean, not even necessarily. Well, that's at least my experience with that subreddit. Uh, I'm, for some reason, there's a fair amount of like urban planning interest from those people, so that's how I uh, <laughs> know of them. Huh. That's interesting. Uh, the, the world uh, moves in mysterious ways, I suppose. But uh, it does. To me, at least, the sense I get is you now they they're very much opposed to like you know discrimination on like you know all kinds of grounds, you know, race, religion, gender, etc., etc., etc. Uh, but also, fuck yeah, free market. The way I use neoliberal is, I I refer I use it in in terms of or in in the relation to economics. So uh, post Fordism is another term for it, which is after the supply side economics came mm-hmm. into place in the nineteen eighties, uh, uh, the late seventies, seventy nine. Um, it became way more, you know um liberal everything and it became a lot looser and everything became a lot faster and deregulated in terms of economic growth and as far as i see it lib- like the democrats are neoliberals the conservatives and the republicans are neoliberals as long as they don't directly oppose the federal reserve uh, and supply side economics trend that's been going on since the 80s and none of them are right now uh the bernie isn't and um no no public figure in american politics or pretty much danish either like even the most left-wing politicians don't speak in that kind of language um it's all within the context of of contemporary politics so as of right now they're all neoliberals in my book mm-hmm. Next email from Jared, 
who says, The podcast you guys are doing is awesome. I've just started listening to it over the past two weeks, and I'm glad you got your first guest. Keep up the good work, comrades. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Yeah, that's really nice to hear. It's really nice to hear when people reach out and say that they like what we do or have you know feedback for what we can improve on or whatever. It's really, it's, yeah. It is really helpful. Yeah. GV says, hello, guys. I've got a question for you. Why does socialism say that science should be financed and taken care of? Thank you in advance. Why should we pay for science? We uh, already do, so... A, we already do. B, it's a sensible fucking policy. <laughs> so, science <laughs> is kind of useful for uh, a lot of things, surprisingly enough. Uh, you'd be surprised how much uh, you want to use as science on a daily basis. Well, well I mean, the I'm... Of science. Yeah. And also, like, quote-unquote funding science isn't really... Like, that. that's such a vague thing. Like what? What exactly do you mean? I mean, when you say are we talking about funding just science? public financing of science, which go? I mean, yeah, but like science, I'm a little science could be it, anything. To be honest, uh, I'm somewhat mixed on public financing. I mean, private funding of science is also pretty shit because it's very clear that uh, you know. But I mean, like even Michelle, in the most uh, paying for like a study saying that you know burning fossil fuels is actually good for the environment. So, mm. Yeah, but even, even in the most libertarian economies on this planet, there's still a ton of funding that goes into science. The only science we'd get otherwise, which I'd be totally in favor of, is like, how delicious is Coca-Cola? Sponsored by Coca-Cola. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, that's the, the science kind of science we get. Science very delicious. <laughs> ten out of yeah. ten scientists agree, <laughs> officially, that Coca-Cola is totally delicious. Yeah, I quite like the model where just like universities get a load of money and they'll decide uh, internally how to uh what things to fund and whatnot because mm -hmm. just leaving it to politicians has its own problems where they'll sponsor like certain uh you know reports or whatever which basically have to have the conclusion that their policies are good yeah which well i mean i don't think that it would ever bunch. like yeah I don't, I don't think that uh in any not that I'm aware of anyway, that in any society, governments have directly asked uh, universities to get someone to write a scientific report about a specific topic. The way that it's done, from my understanding, is that the, gov the, the universities get a certain amount of money to each institute, and they get to decide what it goes towards. The government can, in some systems, say, we want to support the natural sciences with this much money and the humanities with this much money. So there's more money to give grants to science or more money to give grants to humanities, whatever. But oh, it's, yeah, it's always do done through well. intermediaries, yeah. yeah. Not always, at least not in this country. We also have specifically the government's... Uh, I don't know exactly how this process works, but they do directly fund certain specific research projects to find specific things out. Uh, there's some quite Through a grants bit. Uh, or um, no, no, specifically just say like, hey, we want research done on this topic, and this is the money we have available for it. That's very specific. Like, we want say research on. Uh, let's see, like I think two years ago, there's this motion passed by. Uh, our parliament, which said we want um, to fund this research, which is going to make a comparative analysis of all the different prostitution uh, laws around the European countries. Also, they, they put together someone, a committee. Yeah, they're just going to pay some scientists to actually do that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's true. Yeah. That's true. That yeah, is something. Yeah, but they don't go for do. like an intermediary of like the <clears> university or that. They just directly uh, pay for this stuff. No, that is true. That is a different way of doing it. But that's more like. De that's that's com as far as I see it anyway. That's detached from the university system and the education yeah, yeah, system. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, that's, uh, the, that's the government going. I'm not a fan of that. Uh, I'm not a fan of that. Uh, I, rare, I don't even never really trust those <laughs> reports or studies anyway. Because I mean, that's almost always directly done for a specific goal. And surprisingly enough, they always happen to agree exactly with the policies of the parties which instigated that uh, study. It's very yeah, weird. That's yeah, I mean, you can make a very good point that those committees are inherently political because they get the chance to pick the lecturers and professors and people who work yeah. at the universities and, and institutes that agree like, with hey, the we're politicians. We're not going to get paid if we fucking agree with these people. So. Yeah, I mean, what are what are the odds of a conservative yeah, government uh, co forming a committed committee around a Marxist professor? Yeah. Like, I don't see that so, happening. Yeah, in that sense, I'm not a big fan of uh, the public financing of science, but... Uh, 
Yeah, but yeah, I see that as different to um, the educational system in general. Yeah. All right. That was it for emails uh, for this week. This episode of Shit Island is also brought to you by our patrons over on patreon.com forward slash Asher Scapegoat. Thank you to Not Jojo, Nian Changming, M. Lim, and Joshua Cheeseman. Thank you to you people. You make this possible. And um, yeah, everyone else, please do donate because it really helps us. Yeah, yes. even those of you uh, who donated uh, just one dollar and therefore technically didn't get enough to have your name read on this podcast, uh, still thank you. We appreciate you, you too. <laughs> we appreciate you too. There are quite a few of you now. And we absolutely appreciate you too. Yeah. Not to humble brag, but it would take quite a while to read all of you guys' names. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why we reserve that for the $5 patrons only. Annoy yeah. the goat and uh, up your uh, your donation. Yeah, make the segment take, I don't know how fucking long. Uh... <laughs> oh yeah, like half the podcast is reading people's names. Yeah. yeah. Make it make it into those uh, philosophy tube credits or uh, contrapoints <laughs> credits that just go on forever of people's names. Yeah, that would be a fun minutes. way to attend the podcast. Yeah, we'd have to like speed up our audio as we read. Yes, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm down. <laughs> All right. So everyone, thank you for tuning in this week. We hope you enjoyed the topic and the discussion. If you have any comments, feel free to leave comments or send mm-hmm. us an email at shitislandshow at gmail dot com. That's shitislandshow. Uh, mm-hmm. at gmail.com uh, I would really I think it would be fun to have like fan art is that just me maybe maybe that people have to see cool. us live yeah if you if you know how to do that and you if you have the time that would be hilarious we would share it or or and and shout out you or whatever mm-hmm. even if um, even if you don't consider yourself an artist even if you don't think you're very good just draw something in fucking Microsoft Paint even yeah. if you make just fucking stickman figures we'll appreciate it oh, we'll yeah. get a great laugh out of it and we'll we'll give you a shout out um, mm-hmm. So yeah, everyone, thank you so much, and yeah. have a good oh, week. Wait. Also, we have a Twitter. Oh, yes, apparently that's right. <laughs> Twitter dot com slash shit island show. Go follow us there. Yes, follow our Twitter at uh, shit island show, and, and follow me at the Peter Rhodes and the goat at at Mio Sidane. Uh, you can reach me by joining the Discord server. That's right. I no longer like small announcement. I no longer read the comment section because oh gods. Yeah, we have to talk uh, about you, that next you time. You people have disappointed me, I'll just say that. <laughs> so I'm no right. longer checking that. But you can still reach me via the Discord, so <laughs> come join us there. And uh, Yes. If you join and ask, Jules will tell you the story of why she no longer reads the comments. <laughs> Indeed. It, yeah. It's not a very interesting story. Oh, no, no. You have to be a $15 <laughs> patron for that. Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you have to be one of the... Yeah. The lucky ones. But if you sign up on the day that this episode goes up and become a five dollar patient, I'll tell you as well. Just a little mm. special. <laughs> <laughs> That's All the right. secret way. But uh anyway. Thank you so much. See you next episode of Shit Island where we will talk about something else that is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.